Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Tim Moore, your host for this program and the Senior Evangelist of Lamb and Lion Ministries. Our Jesus in the Old Testament series has explored appearances of the Messiah through types, symbols, and actual Christophanies, pre-incarnate appearances of our Lord and Savior. We've established that references to Jesus Christ are woven throughout the Word of God, pointing to His first advent and His glorious second coming. Second Kings continues the historical narrative of God's chosen people, Israel. After the passing of David and Solomon, the United Kingdom divided in two, with Judah and Israel holding the allegiance of various tribes. God ongoingly raised up prophets to speak to one or both of the kingdoms, calling His people to turn back to Him. But reflecting the collective heart of the people, most of the kings of Judah and all of the kings of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Sadly, some of the kings who were considered righteous in their youth strayed grievously from the Lord in their old age. Reflecting a period from about 600 to 900 B.C., 2 Kings offers a sad commentary on the decline of a nation that originally pledged itself to a relationship, a covenant relationship, to Almighty God. We'll explore the obvious application the biblical record offers us still today. 2 Kings also offers us glimpses of God's great mercy and grace that would be extended to all people, Jew first, but Gentile alike. Our guest today is a recognized expert on ancient Near Eastern history and Hebrew, and he has written much about the rich history of the Jewish people as revealed in the Old Testament. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Douglas Petrovich, an esteemed professor of biblical exegesis from the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. And Dr. Petrovich, we're so glad you could be with us today. Thank you, Tim. It's great to be with you. And you can call me Doug if you'd like. Well, I would certainly like to do that. Obviously, I'm just plain old Tim, as I tell people. So, Doug, you have a very unique perspective on the nation of Israel and its history. And as someone who has researched and can actually read the ancient languages and their original text, what can you affirm about the reliability of the Scriptures as revealed in the Old Testament? Well, I would say first of all that the Bible is definitely uh, a, a historical document. It's not intended to be um, you know, a, a collection of fables or myths or stories just drawn together, but it's actual history that's been recorded with, uh, with events that took place in space and time. So, um, when, we, when we talk about biblical history, we, all, we often go into the area of archaeology. Mm. Um, we can demonstrate that s through archaeological excavations and artifacts that have been found, we can demonstrate that there have been um, important confirmations about various things related to biblical history. And there's one exciting one that's in my new book that we'll talk about at some point, um, which is the identification of uh, Joseph and one of the names that we, uh, one of the titles that we read about um, that Pharaoh gave to him, which is um, controller of the entire land. There's mm. an ancient inscription that mentions um, him with this title of controller of the entire land. And of course, in Exodus 41, uh, I'm sorry, in Genesis 41 41, there's a reference there to um, how Pharaoh elevated Joseph to a position where he was in charge of the entire land of Egypt. So it matches perfectly with this inscription that's been found. I recently was uh, doing a sermon on Joseph and his Egyptian name and how insightful that was just to the, the position of responsibility he has. So to, to follow up on that, obviously we do want to talk about your book uh, later telling people how they can get a hold of it, but mm -hmm. what have you found pointing to Joseph and really the origin of, of Israel as a nation identified as tribes who came out of Egypt? Mm -hmm. Lots that's been found and it took nine years of research to put all of this together. Um, one of the exciting things is uh, in ancient Egyptian um, hieroglyphic inscriptions, I've been able to identify five members of the family. So that's Jacob, Joseph, Joseph's two oldest sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh being the oldest and the older between the two, and then one of Manasseh's obscure sons named Shechem that you only read about in Joshua chapter 17, verse 2, the only wow. reference to Manasseh's children. Wow. And so that the historical record, as opposed even to Scripture, matches and proves to us that the Bible is true from beginning to end. It does, and it's chronologically sound as well. In fact, the foundation with which you, can, you have to properly uh, synchronize Israelite history and Israelite chronology with Egyptian history and Egyptian chronology, um, all of that is the basis 
on which you make proper synchronizations and talk about what happened at a certain point in time and so forth. So it's all not only historically accurate, but it's chronologically accurate as well. Well, that's one of the things that we emphasize here is the literal interpretation of Scripture from beginning to end and the chronological and historical reliability. I love Joseph's name, and this is what I hearken to, Zephanath Panea, mm -hmm. which is Egyptian, but it has special meaning as well. Mm -hmm. Well, as we turn to, to Second Kings, we move through the period of the judges, and obviously the first two uh, or three kings of Israel, Saul followed by David and Solomon, who both united the kingdom and expanded it. We get to Second Kings when this grandeur of a united kingdom had, uh, had gone away. In other words, uh, it had evolved into a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Judah. What was the wedge that drew these various tribes to separate into two different kingdoms? Well, it goes back to the choices that were made, first of all, by the kings, and second of all, by the people. Um, David was a man after God's own heart. Solomon, in, especially in his old age, he turned away from the Lord, which is an amazing statement when you understand what we read about uh, in the wisdom literature, especially the Proverbs. How could a man who knows God so well and be so wise turn away from Him? And the Scripture says, actually, in 2 Kings, that it's his foreign wives who pulled his heart away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what they did, of course, is they brought in their own pagan deities. And, and, and Solomon essentially embraced those same deities and built high places um, and, and built um, uh, worship centers where they were worshiping these false gods. And this really is where it kind of began. And there's also a reference uh, that we find uh, foreshadowing of another number that ends up in the latter part of Scripture. But one particular year, uh, Solomon, in his wealth and in his wisdom, gained a lot of, of income. How many talents of gold did he receive according to Scripture? Do you remember that? Ooh, I don't remember Ooh. the exact number. Uh, I think you will. It was 666 talents of gold, okay. almost reflecting this heart that became more focused on materialism, the, uh, the pull of the world, and his wives who brought in pagan influence. So that 666 came back even later. I find that to be just a beautiful, uh, sad uh, way that the Lord weaves things into Scripture that mm -hmm. come to bear later, even in our understanding. Well, uh, as the book of 2 Kings opens, obviously we have Elijah and Elisha as these two figures who are prophets, spokesmen largely for God, and they regularly confront the kings and powerfully demonstrate the providence of God to protect and provide to His people if they will just honor and obey Him. Why didn't they? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a great question, but um, you know the the leaders were guiding the people away from the Lord, and and it was difficult for the people to follow when they didn't have a, a king who was setting an example. So really, it comes back to the as it always does. It comes back to the leadership. If you have strong leaders who um, have their heart open to the Lord and they're walking with God, you're going to have people who see the kind of life that should be lived, and they'll use it as a model and they'll follow. Well, I also love the fact that even in the opening chapters of 2 Kings, there are examples of how there's another important truth revealed even in the Old Testament. God's providence, His blessing is not just for the Jewish people, although for the Jew first, but also for the Gentiles. So we can look back at examples like Rahab and Ruth, but right here in 2 Kings there are Gentiles who are blessed by mm -hmm. the, the prophets of God, but really by God Himself. Yeah, and one example of that is, is a Shunammite woman. Um, you know, and she married into the sons of the prophets, and then um, her her husband, of course, who was in old age at the time, he wasn't able to to give her a child, and she was worried about this. And she went to the prophet. She went to Elisha, and she asked him about this, and he told her that she would be you know bearing a son within a year. And sure enough, a year later comes by, and she bears a child. Well, once that child grows, um, and he's in his youth. He, he somehow dies, and we don't really know the story about it, mm -hmm. you know, from what, hap what happened, what's recorded in the Bible. But he dies somehow, and at that point, um, the, the woman, of course, who's connected to the prophets and mm -hmm. connected to Elisha, and she knows that God could intercede on, on her behalf. So she has enough faith that she goes and seeks out the prophet Elisha, finds him, and asks him to come. So he comes to her house, and you know what he does? He clears people out of the room. He lays on top of the body of her son, you know, eye on eye, hand on hand, leg on leg, lays on top of him fully, and he prays to the Lord. And what happens? 
but he comes to life. Yes. And that shows the incredible mercy that God has for this seemingly insignificant Gentile woman, right? The Shunammite woman who's not uh, connected to the line of Abraham right. through, um, through blood. But because God's love extends to the Gentiles, we can see it in examples like this. We see it also with Naaman, who was the commander of a foreign army. Mm -hmm. And let's just say his faith was, uh, was a little bit limited, and even his obedience was grudging, but he did obey. And so he went and washed in the Jordan River and was healed, demonstrating God's providence and blessing for people all around the world, still today. Still today. Well, in 2 Kings, how, what would you describe as being the theme of this book and how it relates to the overall purpose of God's revelation? Well, I would say first of all that uh, 2 Kings actually, if you look at it in the Hebrew Bible, it's not part of two books, it's one book in itself. So First and Second Kings is one book in Hebrew. And probably the best uh, understanding of you know, what the theme is of that book is that it's um, it's the covenant failures mm. of the monarchs, right? The covenant failures of the monarchs. So ultimately, uh, Second Kings would probably be best understood as a continuation of the covenant failures of the monarch. Well, I love what you say about that, the covenant failures, not God's failure, the failure of people. And so that harkens to what I would ask next. Why did the northern kingdom fall? It fell to Assyria, uh, and eventually, of course, Judah fell as well. But what does Scripture say regarding the fall of Israel. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's a lot in the Scripture that deals with this very question. Um, and it's difficult even to say, you know, we can easily find the beginning point. But one perfect example is um, when Solomon uh, commits all of the atrocities he does uh, in Israel and turns his heart from the, from the Lord and follows after pagan gods, um, God promises him that, that one of his servants would be uh, raised up and that that servant would take over part of the kingdom. And of course, he takes most of the tribes, pretty much all but the tribe of Judah. So Jeroboam the first, he's called by scholars, he becomes that first king of the northern tribe. And what he did is he led the people away from God and into idolatry. He set up high places uh, throughout Israel. Mm. Um, he introduced foreign gods to them. Um, he, he led them away from the worship of, of He who is, the, the covenant name of right. God, and, um, and Israel followed after Him. So that essentially is, is the launching point uh, for the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom pretty much follows suit. They see what happens in Israel. They see all of the, um, uh, the enjoyable, enticing sin that Israel, their, their cousins in Israel have participated in, and they fall right into the same thing. Well, all of this is described clearly in 2 Kings chapter 17. I would even say beginning in verse 7 and continuing down ver through verse 23. Mm -hmm. But the Lord says, you, you didn't obey. You didn't stay in that covenant relationship. I even sent prophets to warn, and you did not listen to them. Mm -hmm. What does that uh, say to us today in terms of God's blessing that has been poured out on our nation alone, let alone others in this world, and yet are turning away from Him. Where do we fall given this mm -hmm. principle? Sure, Tim. And essentially, this becomes a red flag for us. And it becomes a moment where we need to look into the mirror and say, for me individually, for my church, for my Christian culture, and for us as believers around the world, what are we doing as far as following um, the laws and the statutes, um, just as Israel did, but even more importantly, from the heart, are we truly following after God, or are we falling into the kinds of sins that they did then? So, if we fall into such sins, then God is going to unleash His anger and His mm -hmm. fury on us, as He did with them. And remember what happened then. They were carted off, the survivors, and of course, most of them were killed, impaled by um, spears in many cases because the Neo-Assyrians were brutal people. They were among the most brutal of the ancient peoples. So the, the few that survived, the, the small percentage that survived, they were carted off into parts of Assyria and had to interbreed with the people there and were forced to live a very degraded lifestyle. That's so right. that, that's a real important message for us that if we give ourselves over to sin and we do not repent as we right. need to, then such such demise can befall us as well. Well, and the, the reality is, too, we cannot follow leaders, whether they are elected leaders, political leaders, cultural leaders, who are taking us in a wrong direction collectively. And we have a responsibility, at least in this country, for who we elect to lead us and whether or not they reflect godly principles. 
the God of Scripture or whether they are taking us to worship pagan gods or to follow after false promises and false hopes. So, Doug, let's turn back for a minute to Israel's original deliverance and establishment of a nation. And you've done a lot of research into the archaeological evidence pointing to the Exodus and even to the timing of the Jewish people leaving captivity in Israel, what did, or excuse me, in Egypt. What did you find? Well, essentially, Tim, I stumbled into evidence. And because of my prior research, I already knew who the Exodus Pharaoh was. That's Amenhotep II of the 18th dynasty of Egypt. And I already knew the timing of the Exodus. And that, of course, is from passages such as 1 Kings 6 1, which mentions, mentions exactly the right year when the, um, the Exodus took place, because it was 479 and change, 479 years and some months before the building of the temple under Solomon began. So um, I already knew those things. And then what I stumbled into was evidence that connects to the 10th plague on Egypt. Hmm. And that's in the form of the four animals we read about in Exodus 11 and 12, which is dogs, cattle, sheep, and goats. At the right site where Jacob and his family settled, at that very site in the palatial district in Moses' day, and this translates to the middle of the 15th century BC, what we find there is mass burials, in other words, multiple animals. Uh, most of them are sheep and goats, and the majority of the sheep and goats were killed in their first year of age, mm. which when you read your English Bible, it's not quite that precise in the way that it's worded. It says that they were one-year-olds, right. right, for the time of the Passover. But really what it says in Hebrew is ben shana, which means son of a year, and the equivalent in English is less than a year. And wow. that's exactly what fits the archaeological evidence. And the very little pottery that's connected with those burials is the pottery that was used during the reigns of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II, his son, the Exodus Pharaoh. So wow. it all fits perfectly. It all fits perfectly. I dare say that many of us probably get more of our understanding of, of some of that era of biblical history from movies like the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. instead of actually diving into the Word of God or doing the research like you have done archaeologically and, and through your understanding of those uh, Near Eastern languages and ancient texts. You know, some Christians, and a lot of Christians, I dare say, like to say, uh, proclaim, I'm a New Testament Christian. In other words, I just I've, I focus on what is revealed from the Gospels forward as if to discount the relevance of the Old Testament to their faith altogether. But the apostles consistently referred to the Old Testament to validate Jesus as the Messiah and to point to His fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. So as an expert of the Old Testament, what would you say to those who claim to be New Testament Christians? Well, you know, there was a moment that's recorded in Luke 24 when Jesus was walking on a road to a city called Emmaus. And there were two men that were walking, and he, they didn't know who he was. He, he had already risen at this time, and he didn't disclose his identity, his identity to them. And he, and he asked them about the things that were going on in Jerusalem, and they basically say to him, you know, can't you see what's going on? Haven't you heard about these things? And what it says there at the end of that um, narrative is that um, Jesus, after He revealed Himself to them, that, that He talked to them about all that was true of Him in the Old Testament yes. through the Pentateuch and through the prophets and how He is a fulfillment of all of these things. So can you imagine the incredible truth that they heard that's not even recorded in the Bible? So at the end of the day, if the, if the Old Testament is important to Jesus, and it clearly was in that conversation. Shouldn't it be important to us? Well, I would think it should be extremely important to us. It certainly is. Uh, Second Kings admittedly contains some very horrifying scenes. We have cannibalism during the siege of Samaria. We have a woman sharing, uh, two women sharing their sons for dinner, if you will. And then we have a Moabite king who sacrifices his son to inspire his forces to battle and to win a victory against Israel. On and on, the, the loss of the Shumanite woman until uh, she is, or he is restored to life uh, through the, the prayers of Elisha. Where in the midst of all that human suffering can we see Jesus Christ in 2 Kings? Mm -hmm. And certainly Jesus doesn't appear physically until, you know, around 500 years later. So he's not there at the site with them. But um, we see mercy in so many ways. Um, and one of the ways I think that's important where we see mercy is, um, is, is with the uh, Jehu's destruction of the, the temple of Baal. And of course, that was the pagan god who was the 
uh, king of the gods mm -hmm. at that time in the, in the first millennium BC in the Levant. And of course, the Israelites lived in the Levant. So this is the god that the Israelites, I'm sorry, that the, um, the peoples of the land went after more than any other. And the Israelites followed right after that. So what, what happened was um, God raised up Jehu to destroy the temple of Baal. And what he did also, he collected all of the prophets and all of the priests and all of the followers of Baal. And he essentially, you know, herded them into one building and he had his men kill every one of those people. Why did he do that? Sounds like such a terrible thing. Those were the people responsible for leading God's people away from God. So God had to clean, to purify his country and his people and his land. And that's Amen. how he did it. So essentially, you're seeing the mercy of God through that act of uh, judgment. So the very fact that we see that taking place demonstrates um, a, a level of mercy looking ahead to the protection of God's people, which is, which is, of course, a picture of the mercy of Jesus, that he extends his loving kindness to all who would believe in him. Well, if what we call First and Second Kings, or a single unified book in Hebrew, uh, offers a sweeping overview of the nations of Israel and Judah and their eventual uh, taking into captivity and leading into exile, where is there hope in such a narrative? And, and Doug, for you personally, where do you find hope as we follow down that same path toward destruction even today? Sure. And Tim, I, I actually want to kind of mix it up here. When we talk about hope, we usually want to look at it from a human perspective, from a physical, three-dimensional perspective. But really, I think the best place we can see hope is from a spiritual uh, perspective, from an eternal perspective, which ultimately is God's per perspective. So when I see things like the way that God has taken off, carted off his people into captivity, we see with the northern kingdom. And then, of course, later it shows up with Judah, too, as they sure. go to, to Babylonia. Um, when I see that, that shows me hope. Why? Because what God's doing there is that He's protecting His righteousness. He has to be righteous. He has to be just. He has to be pure because that's inherent within His character. So when He zealously protects His righteousness by taking sin and dealing with it in a difficult and painful way, what that shows me is that we can have hope in God because the message of the gospel comes to life. Because my sin then becomes all the more vivid to me. Wow. And, I, and my hope in, in eternity with God is changed completely when I realize what God has done with me in solving my sin issue and nailing it all on the cross with Christ. Wow, that, that's beautifully said. And, and that is an important sentiment, putting things in a, an eternal perspective, in a godly perspective, and not just on the human dimension, although His care and love is for us. Uh, well, Doug, I am so grateful that you joined us today, but I want our viewers to know how they can follow you and your research and maybe get a copy of your book. Sure, Tim. And you can find me on academia.edu. I have a, a web page there with lots of materials that are downloadable for free. Uh, peer-reviewed articles that I've published, uh, other writings, several translations of, of biblical books that I've done that are up there. Um, lots of great documents that are there and available for people uh, to look at and benefit from. But in addition to that, of course, is my new book, which is Origins of the Hebrews, New Evidence of Israelites in Egypt from Joseph to the Exodus. And this is nine years of research that, that's gone into this book and an amazing amount of, of incredible artifacts and historical synchronisms between the Israelites and the Egyptians. That's really one of a kind book because there's no other book that's been attempted like this that actually provides evidence for Israelites in Egypt for the 430 years that the Bible describes. Well, I'm so glad that you have brought your expertise to us today. I hope you will come back and share it with us again. But Doug, thank you for what the Lord has uh, laid on your heart, the insights He's given you, and for joining us today. My pleasure, Tim, and I will look forward to coming back. We'll have you back. I'm joined once again by my co-host, Nathan Jones. And, and let me say this about Nathan. If you regularly tune in to our Christ in Prophecy television program, but have never visited our Christ in Prophecy website, you are really missing out. As our internet evangelist, Nathan maintains a platform that contains an incredible library of Lamb and Lion resources. You can watch past episodes of Christ in Prophecy, download our bi-monthly magazine, The Lamplighter, order books and DVDs, 
read one of our thousands of articles, or simply engage in dialogue regarding Bible prophecy. Nathan interacts daily with visitors to our website and our social media platforms from across the country and around the world. Well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that plug, and I think that our Internet evangelism ministry reaches the 4.5 billion people out there accessible on the Internet, so I'm excited about it. Uh, folks, we've been encouraging you to go dig deeper on our weekly Jesus in the Old Testament episodes by visiting our website and to review the key verse commentaries listed under each video. There's so much more there. You know, the same thing could be said about the entire Word of God. There is so much more there. And the promises contained in Revelation that for those who read and heed the book apply to the entire Word of God, for those who read, study, and heed what it contains. And we do hope you'll visit our website to find our commentary on 2 Kings 5, 1 through 14 and 17, 13 through 14, our key verses this week. Well, I enjoyed hearing Dr. Petrovich's insights into 2 Kings and learning about the archaeological and historical validation of God's Word, including the history of the children of Israel into Egyptian captivity. Yeah, I did too. And I was really grateful for his insights that he shared with us regarding God's determination to protect His own righteousness and holiness. You know, some of the difficult episodes in the Bible make sense when you read them from God's perspective instead of man's perspective. Yes, and when we understand what the foul offensiveness of our own sin is to a holy God, we begin to realize the amazing love He's demonstrated for us. As Paul wrote, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He certainly did. You know, folks, First and Second Kings and Chronicles offers a historical narrative of the nations of Judah and Israel. His covenant relationship with the Jewish people, His chosen people, points to the relationship He offers to us as Christians as well. And the prophecies of the Old Testament revealed through Jewish prophets point to Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah who offers salvation to Jew and Gentile alike. And there are so many lessons in Israel's history and so much prophetic significance tied together with Israel that we frequently draw attention to what God is doing relative to Jewish people even today. So if you'd like to drill down on Israel and Bible prophecy, Dr. David Reagan's book by that same name is a great resource. It's going to inform your understanding and bring the promises of Scripture alive before your very eyes. And for a gift of $20 or more, including shipping, we'll ship it to you. Just call the number you see on the screen. The theme for this episode has been focused on 2 Kings and is the kingdom divided. But God promised that in the end times He would draw the Jewish people back to the promised land and establish them again as one nation, undivided, on the mountains of Israel. He has certainly done just that. Speaking of the validity of His promises, next week we will turn to Ezra and focus on promises kept. Until then, I'm Tim Moore. And I'm Nathan Jones saying, look up, be watchful, for the Lord who strongly supports those whose heart is completely His is drawing near. Yeah.